Hi there, welcome to the next video in our series of revision videos looking at the economics of externalities and market failure. Now, in the last video, we, we went through some analysis diagrams showing how uh, you can visualize diagrammatically negative externalities from production and also the social welfare loss. Let's spend a few minutes thinking about different types of intervention from government, different parts of types of policy that might be used to control externalities and also crucially to uh, reduce the market failure. Quick reminder from the last video, what is the essential point about negative externalities and market failure? And the point is uh, that often in markets, agents, producers, consumers, they do not take account of the costs, the external costs that their decisions impose on others. And therefore, the free market price, the price mechanism, fails to price negative externalities properly, leading to excessively high output from a social perspective. Now, if you have market failure, there is a case for some form or forms of government intervention. Uh, market failure doesn't ordinarily correct itself. Yes, there can be lots of innovation amongst private agents, uh, businesses that actually money, of course, and profit to be made, from uh, innovations that reduce pollution, for example, and waste. And uh, being good can be commercially uh, successful and beneficial for businesses. But there's nearly always some kind of case to be made for a form of intervention in the market. One of the options, and we have a separate video on this, we're going to cover it briefly today, but we do have separate videos on carbon taxes or pollution taxes. So this is the so-called Pigouvian idea that uh, in, in a world of negative externalities, you should make the polluter pay. In other words, turn an external cost into an internal cost. And the obvious way is to impose some sort of cost or tax on carbon. Uh, a carbon tax has been brought in by many countries. Others are considering it. It's a policy designed to make the polluter pay for the externalities created. In other words to turn an external cost into an internal cost. And we call that internalizing the externality. So here's the diagram that you could draw if you were asked to uh, analyze uh, and then hopefully evaluate a carbon tax. Here's our diagram showing negative externalities from production. The free market output is Q1. The social optimum output is Q2. And therefore we need the market to fairly reflect the external cost of production. The most external cost at Q2 is the distance BC. Well, a carbon tax, a Pigouvian make the polluter pay tax, is designed to increase the supply costs of the producer, the supplier. So we shift marginal private cost up by the amount of the tax. And hopefully, hopefully that is sufficient to cause output to contract towards the social optimum output of Q1. So a carbon tax is designed to increase the internal costs of the polluter to reflect the external costs. And of course, a carbon tax will, in theory, generate some tax revenue, which could be used by the government. It could be hypothecated, for example, dedicated, earmarked to fund clean energy, or it could be used as a rebate to affect those impacted by a carbon tax. Uh, there's the tax revenue uh, from the carbon tax. And it's if you're drawing a, a good analysis diagram for your assessments, don't forget to include the carbon tax revenue in your diagram. There's a deadweight loss of social welfare if you don't tax, shown by the area ABC. So a carbon tax, in theory, is a, an effective, a good way of offsetting, if you like, internalising the externalities. Now, we're not going to evaluate this one in this video because we've done a separate video on carbon tax. So just type that into uh, into the YouTube search. Alternative, uh, again, it's trying to put a price on carbon, is to create a system of marketable carbon permits. The European Union, of course, has done this. Emissions trading is where you fix the supply of carbon permits. Each permit is worth one tonne of CO2. Uh, and you, you over time, you gradually squeeze the supply. You make these permits scarcer. Uh, and as there's uh, a reduced supply for a given level of demand, the price goes up. And of course, if the price of carbon goes up, then in theory, 
there's a greater incentive for firms to to cut their uh, pollution, find cost reducing pollution reducing innovations and techniques. So many countries do now put a price on carbon. This is from 2019, I think, uh, from a survey actually based in the spring of 2018. But you can see here, for example, that Sweden has the highest carbon tax of leading countries, $139 uh, per metric tonne of CO2. Switzerland has a high carbon tax. Uh, the UK, of course, has now left the EU. We have a minimum price for carbon. Uh, and the key question really for the UK going forward is whether to uh, to develop an alternative system of carbon trading or perhaps to replace that with a carbon tax. And of course, there are big debates about how, how to put a price on carbon, which reflects, if you like, the social cost of carbon. Enormous debate in the literature about what that cost is, how high it should be. Uh, big big uh, discussions at the moment about the extent of uh, externalities, external costs in shipping, for example. I'm told it's worth something like 3% of global emissions. And some people are now saying that uh, there should be a huge fee of over $250 per tonne to drive users to low emissions targets. And the European Union is considering, and this is very topical, might be worth adding to your notes, a carbon border tax. Basically, a tax on carbon emissions attributed to imported goods that haven't been carbon taxed at home at their source. So, for example, high carbon products coming into the EU would have a tax applied. And it's basically designed to motivate foreign producers and EU importers to reduce their carbon emissions. It's a really interesting idea. How is it going to be developed? How is it going to be implemented? How is it going to be monitored? And things are, are, are substantial points to be considered. But at least the European Union is thinking about introducing a carbon border tax as part of their strategy to, to bring down emissions. Another alternative, so we've done carbon taxation, carbon trading. A third alternative is to regulate, introduce laws and regulations. A regulatory intervention is basically where you use the power of law to try to control externalities. From smoking bans in public places to minimum age laws for gambling and tanning salons, the EU has brought in a maximum of CO2 emissions per kilometre for all new vehicles. Regulations requiring recycling of household appliances, such as washing machines. The government, the UK government, is banning wet wood for use in indoor wood burners going forward. Uh, things like regulations on the amount of fish that can be caught in the oceans. So regulation is a key aspect of government approach to externalities. In many ways, there's a strong case for regulating. On the one hand, it acts as a spur for business innovation to cut the level of, of emissions. Um, it may be more effective than carbon taxes, particularly if the, if the demand for carbon permits, for example, is, is price inelastic. And each year you can toughen the regulations, you can tighten the squeeze uh, to stimulate, for example, low carbon green investments. However, regulations come with costs, the cost of enforcement, cost of administration, Always the risk, of course, that you get unintended consequences, which you were covered in year 12, which is a cause of government failure. And high levels of regulation, regulatory barriers, if you like, uh, red tape, that can be a, quite a significant burden on small businesses and may, may indeed dissuade small businesses from entering markets, which could then lead to a further market failure arising from monopoly power. So loads of, loads of arguments for and against uh, regulation. OK, so in the next video, we're going to put together a series of multiple choice questions to check your understanding on government interventions.